So, uh, one of my dream garden update videos I did a few weeks ago, I was talking about how I was doing a little experiment with my rutabagas. You know, earlier in the fall when I grew some, we was cutting the greens off of them, and that works great, and I ended up making some decent sized softball sized rutabagas. But I wanted to see what would happen if I don't pluck the greens off of them. Now, you have to bear with me, one of these is split a little bit because we had a lot of rain, but... You've had a lot of rain? Yeah. I believe you make a little bigger rutabaga if you don't pluck the greens off. Now you still pluck them now. I used all the greens in our vegetable bags this week. We give everybody rutabagas and the greens. So I ripped the greens off and then um, and then we got these here. So I was at the store yesterday and I was looking at how big they were. And that's that's about what they sell in Maybe just tear bigger at the grocery store, store around yeah. here. So these nice. things that they take a little more time to clean than a lot of vegetables I grow. And I don't know if it's a, because uh, I've only ever grown them for transplants. But when you grow them from transplants, uh, you get a lot of kind of root knottage right here. And there's a lot of dirt in there. And you can't wrench it off all the way. So you have to kind of wrench them off. Then take your knife, trim them up, well, wrench I them can, off one more time. I can tell you this. The commercial people don't grow them from transplants. They direct seed them. But you, from my experience, you really need them about eight inches apart to... to uh, well, they can put them there with these vacuum planters. Yeah. Um, so so you, need, you need to have a good little spacing on them. Yep. But uh, I like transplanting them so far. And uh, I'm going to keep transplanting them until... Well, you keep doing that. I'm going to keep doing it. Now, they, here's, here's one a little on the smaller side there. But that's still going to eat it. And tonight, I'm going to make me some uh, hamburger steak and onions and mashed bakers. You heard of mashed taters? I'm gonna make mashed bakers. We're gonna try that tonight. That sounds good. You put butter and all in there? I'm gonna put some butter in there, maybe some buttermilk, and a little sour cream, heavy cream. I, I, I read a recipe online that said put some dill in there. And if any of y'all out there got any good mashed baker recipes, um, let me know. Hmm. And uh, I said something about onions earlier. I want to show. This right here. Now look at it. Now that's some. I have grown some vegetation. Yes, you have. On that one right there. Uh, I got the green on it. They just starting to bulb. Now these are some I planted in early, early November. This is some we I grew out in the greenhouse before we got our Dixondale plants in. That's a Texas legend right there. If I can get hold of my knife. You can have that piece right there if you want. <laughs> I'll cut me in there. Mm-hmm. That's all right. Now, when, it comes eat like to, apple. when it comes to onions, a lot of people out there go for sweetness. Me, personally, the, the number one quality I look for in an onion is storage ability. Because of what I do, I need them to store for five to six months and the sweetest onions always ain't the best storing onions and that's why that texas ledger is my favorite because you get a little bit of both but it's not the sweetest onion out there it's not the sweetest and it ain't, ain't supposed to be it no. has never claimed to be right the sweetest out there but as far as one that's a little bit sweet and that will store well that's the one to go to you can tell i use that ammonium sulfate on there it's got a little um Tastes like an onion. I taste it. Now you want to talk about? Some well, what I want to talk about is this right here. Y'all see them specks on them leaves right there? That is what we call blight. Now, it's got a fancy name I can tell you, but I'm not going to bore you with all that. This is a blight that gets on onions when we have particular weather situations like we've had this year, and when you put too much fertilizer to your onions when they start bubbling. Your onions are most success successful. Susceptible. Susceptible. There we go. To this particular blight when they start the bulbing process and when you have really wet conditions, which we know we've all had. Now, I ain't fertilized mine in several weeks. I laid off. Well, and yours is not as severe as some of the other I've seen. So yours is not that bad. There's some pretty good looking green leaves there. However, you do have some. Now, I have a patch out there that's a lot worse than this. And uh -huh. somebody posted a picture the other night on I saw that. Theirs is pretty bad. Theirs is pretty bad. This is what I think happened. That patch that I've got that is worse shape than the rest of them was fertilized late. 
Now, I put some 20-20-20 on there about a week and a half ago, and I knew I was cutting it close, but I just couldn't stand myself. <laughs> In hindsight, that was wrong. When your onions start bubbing, you want to make sure that you cut the fertilizer off because excessive fertilizer during the initial bubbing process with excessive rains can lead to this problem here. The more severe you have it, it's probably because you put more fertilizer down than you should or you've had more rain. Now, there's nothing we can do about the rain. There are some chemicals out there that will, that will help control this preventively. There's not a whole lot you can do after you get it. Don't worry about it. You probably still make onions. But it's just one of them wet years that we have these issues. Don't Just don't fret over a lot. We're going to do the best we can and go from there. But I have got it bad. And let me tell you something. I didn't have it one day, and I walked out there the next day, and it was there. That's how quick it happens. Mm. But we've had a lot of rain. We have had a lot of rain. And you don't put fertilizer on them onions when they start bubbling because you can cause yourself some what? Issues. Yep, that's right. When right. you got nice green leaves like that right there, you don't need no more fertilizer. Right. I mean that. that I know better. Now, than I did it anyway. I know we we try to grow onion bulbs, and you can't eat but so much of these green onions. But that's about a three foot long onion right yep. here, if y'all can't tell. Yep. Uh, susceptible. Success. And that's what you want. You want a lot of that good vegetation there, because yep. when they do start bulbing. Yeah. Help me with that word again. Su susceptible. Susceptible. I always have trouble with that one. Let's say hey to everybody before you mess up any more words. Hello everyone and welcome to our weekly Row by Row Garden Show. We're really excited to have you joining us tonight. I'm Travis. And I'm Greg. And uh, we've got a really good show planned. We're going to talk about fertilizing potatoes in a little potato fertilization program a little later. Um, if it's your first time joining us on the show, go ahead and hit that subscribe button down below. Hit that bell button so you get notified every time we come out with a new video. And if you're a frequent viewer of the show, it's always good to have you back. I want to say hello to my buddy Ken McFalls over in STEM, North Carolina. I've been working with Ken a little bit the last few days, figuring out he's got him a little bit of a dream garden he's building. We've been working on kind of figuring out his um, what his drip irrigation. I believe going. I can't send him some taters. Yeah, yep. He got some taters. He's cutting them up, getting ready to plant them, and working on getting his drip system set up yep. for his new dream garden. So, hey to Ken out there. Speaking of taters, I planted my taters on Monday. Uh-huh. I did. I yep. had to because it, it just wasn't going to be another break in there. And since then, we've got, I had two inches of rain this morning. I don't know what we got today, but it has come a f floater out there. Yes, it has. Uh, it's today. wet, and I ain't got mine in the ground, and I'm proud of it. Yeah. So um, we'll see if mine make it or not. They were, they were well cured. Uh, some other people were asking about... Uh, Chitting potatoes, and that's where you, I'm scared I'd mess that one up. Well, it and uh, it's once you cut them up, you kind of lay them out on the surface, let them breathe, and uh, it kind of encourages the um, the shoot development there uh, to chit them like that, and so they get a little head start when you plant them. We call it let them heal over, yeah. But the chitting but is I know that's not the technical name, for so it. um. And I've seen people do that before. In my case, I was dealing with about 50 to 60 pounds of, of potatoes, so I didn't really have room to do all that. But I, I would say, uh, as far as chitting goes, and if you got room for it, ain't chit wrong with that. That's right. That's what I say. Um, speaking of taters, I got this. So Now, we get some silly stuff commented on some of our videos and pages and stuff. And a lot of times, I just let it go, just... Just let it go. But I got one here I got to share with y'all. And I'm not going to say this fella's name because he's he, he my subject to be embarrassed at this point. He said, this was on, I can't remember if it was on my tater cutting video or my tater plant video. He said, just so you know, potatoes are a man-made crop. They are not natural, nor did man play by the rules of nature to create it. Therefore, it is non-compatible with the human body. It will make you sick and cause you to become susceptible, as you like to say it, to disease. It is like poisoning yourself slowly over time. If they made it any more deadly, people would put two and two together. See how man Frankenstein the potatoes by adding starch. Gluten is also a starch. Starch is carbonic acid. Carbonic acid bogs the system, it rots in the system and wears the system down. It will rob you of your iron and deliver sulfides into the body and the sulfides will call you can cause you cancer. 
So, folks, uh, this fella right here is pretty serious about not eating any well, potatoes. Well, I disagree with him about the cancer thing because I don't really know about that. But I'll tell you one thing. If I eat me a big old belly full of taters, it bogs me down. <laughs> now, I mean, he may have a point there. Yeah, but I don't know about just being toxic and so terrible for you. I've been no, eating taters I, my whole boy, life. Boy, taters put weight on you. <laughs> uh, and I, I, mean, he, I he tried to, he, there he was, watch me plant. 60, 70 pounds of taters and try to make me feel bad about but it. But I think they are actually native to somewhere in South America. Yeah. Peru or somewhere down there. Might be. Might be. But it, it, the, all, I couldn't even think what to say. I just, I told him, I said. Uh, sorry. I'm sorry. Well, I said, as we like to say in the house, bless your heart. Bless your heart. Bless yeah. your heart. And that's all we can say. Yep. Um, a few more things to get to. I, I didn't do a video. I didn't post a video this Wednesday. I'm actually going to change our video posting schedule and spread things out a little bit. So in the past, we did a video on Tuesday, Wednesday, and we do the show obviously on Thursday night. So I'm going to switch that up, folks, and I'm going to do a video still on Tuesday, the show on Thursday, and the other, the third video of the week is going to air on Saturdays now. So just kind of spread it out. Uh, so we're not just throwing so much at you one time. We're going to spread it out that way. Um, what else we got going on? Uh, on our uh, We offended somebody last week, too. Yeah, well, let me get, let's get to this, and then we'll get to that. Okay. So uh had some people asking about some of our varieties that are fairly unique to us, like the jambalaya, okra, the bellarosa tomato. People asking, can they get those in their local feed and seed stores? And um, let me see how I can say this nicely. Without offending anybody. Without offending anybody. Uh, you, you're not going to find them at your local feed and seed stores. And for the most part, what you'll find is that your local feed and seed stores carry uh, what are the cheaper varieties as far as seeds go. The open pollinated ones. Uh, local feed and seed stores aren't prone to take a whole lot of risk. And uh, so that they're not going to pay. And, and we... I can tell you this because we, we have to purchase these seeds in bulk before we repack them for, for you. Uh, some of these varieties we carry cost, can cost 10, 20 times more than some of these open pollinated varieties you get at a local feed and seed store. So they're not taking those risks. I understand why they're not well, taking no, those risks. Well, no, they don't have access to them. They don't have access. You got to have a good bit of you got to move a good bit of inventory to, to be able to, to get those varieties. And so that's why you're not going to find them there. Uh, the local seed and feed stores tend to have what we would call your cheaper varieties, like the Clemson Spineless. And speaking of that, we had a lady on a video last week. We were, we were making fun of your, your buddy, uh, old, old man, man Herod, uh, for wanting to be cheap and only grow the Clemson Spineless. And had a lady get upset. Because she likes to grow Clemson Spouse, and she thought we was calling her cheap. But we wasn't. And I, I just to leave it up top here. We wasn't trying to call her cheap. We were trying to make a point about old man Herod. He was too cheap to grow anything else. And if you like to grow Clemson Spinus, bless your heart, by all means do it. Because that's what you want to do. And we mean no harm about that. And we didn't mean to offend anybody by putting the two together of Clemson Spinus and being cheap. That what was our intentions was. And we got to be, we got, we offend a lot of people. We got to start being a lot more careful, but that's not what we meant. And, uh, and we do need to apologize to her and tell her we're sorry we, about her being cheap or we thought she was cheap. Well, but sometimes it's hard for us to disconnect because we're working during the middle of the day. It's hard to disconnect from what we're doing, stocking inventory and stuff, and then talking here. Because when, when I'm ordering seeds, when I'm ordering hundreds of pounds of seeds, and I order a bunch of jambalaya and I order a bunch of clumps of spineless, that Clemson Spinalis is pretty cheap compared to what that jambalaya costs. Yeah, yeah, I guess it and is. And so, I, in my mind, that's just kind of how I'm kind of thinking about you kind it. Of work, but it's not our intentions to offend anybody. No, 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 no. 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 Uh, and we got to work on that because we seem to be offending a lot of people. Yeah, a lot here. of lot of offense is being taken. Offense being taken, and we're not here to offend anybody. We're here to help people. Uh, but before we before we stop offending people, uh, I got a few more here. Um, so one of my Facebook ads for okra, now, I don't know what it is about the gardening community, but you seem to hear more of these kind of crazy ideas amongst people that garden and homestead and stuff than you do other people. I got news people. for you. They out there everywhere. Yeah. So a fellow told me on one of my, our Facebook ads that he, and you can believe this, I ain't never heard this before. 
He said, told me that I need to soak my okra seeds in buttermilk the night before I plant them. Hmm. Now explain that one to me. Okay, so I'm assuming that he's going to want some type of beneficial bacteria to get on that okra seed and the water to penetrate. I don't know. That's my only conclusion there. That was, okay. a, that was a far reach for me to have to pull that one up. I don't know. I don't know. So I ain't never heard that before. If y'all have heard it, uh, anybody doing that, I can't think of any good reason why you, especially with Well, the, you'd want to run some good buttermilk. <laughs> or some good okra or seed. Or some good okra seed. <laughs> uh, it, uh, speaking of that, we talked about putting an a egg in the hole and a fish in the hole, planting tomatoes. Uh, one of my... Uh, one of my fellow YouTube buddies, uh, we, we stay on high alert for people doing silly stuff like that on videos, and he said they was a YouTuber. I'm not going to name their name recently that planted tomatoes and put a fish in the hole. Uh, you know what they had? A fish in the hole. They had a fish in the hole. If you grind up that fish, uh, it, it would take effect a lot quicker. A whole fish ain't going to do it. But the steel hole, you got to grind up fish in the hole. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it. Like I was saying, within the garden and the homestead, everybody's looking for it. There's a lot of people that reap. You, you know, it's kind of like the moon deal. I don't know if gardeners are more gullible. Is that why people do stuff no, like people this? People just want to find the easier way. And a lot of times, there ain't no easy way. You just got to get out there and do it. You know, I don't ever, and if I'm guilty of it, I, I hope somebody calls me out, but I don't ever recall us coming up with any, any kind of crazy schemes like No. Soaking seeds in buttermilk or putting a fish in the hole or, no. or anything like that. So, um, But we didn't mean to offend anybody by them comments no, we just no, made. No, no. If you do like soak your seeds in buttermilk or putting a fish in the hole, go for it. Uh, I'm sorry. Bless I your apologize. heart. Bless your heart. The last thing I wanted to mention here is the uh, something it kind of poll everybody in the audience if they, if they like to hear the, uh, see me do a video about this. I have a lot of people asking why they can't save seeds from a hybrid and replant them. And you can save seeds from a hybrid and replant them, they just won't be true to variety. And and uh, I was thinking about doing a video and kind of breaking that down on exactly why they won't be true to variety. If that's something you'd like to see, put that in the comments below and we can, we can work on that. A few more things. I've been going over every week trying to go over a few new seed varieties. This week I'm gonna talk about flowers, some new flowers we got. Now, for all you fellows out there, I don't care you the, you think you're the manliest man on the block in the neighborhood. Ain't nothing wrong with putting some flowers in your garden. No, there's not. And uh, and it'll do you got do wonders for your garden. Yeah. Somebody the other day was asking me about companion plant, and I said one of the best things you can companion plant is flowers. Those are all the pollinators in there, and you get in a titan with a wife, and you need to pick some flowers. You got them out there, or you offend somebody else, and you need to carry them some flowers. Yeah. You've always got a backup if you've got some flowers growing in your garden. I grow them in there every year. Yeah, so we got, uh, let me go over. We, we got, working on quite the flower lineup, I'd have to say. I done grabbed two of the same thing. Mm. Uh, so we got the marigold sparky mix which i i didn't i forgot to grab here uh i got some of those in the greenhouse i got about 100 percent germination on I those. they those. are looking good they are. uh we got this bachelor button polka dot mix was another good one and all of these are kind of selected they have longer stems and you can cut them for cut flowers what else we got we got uh this cosmos bright light so we have a cosmos versailles mix that is more uh, pink, white, and red. This one's more kind of yellow and orange. Um, so Hold them still there. You're making everybody nervous. Oh, yeah. shaking around. I am. I get to talking and shaking. So this Cosmos Bright Lights mix. So we got two Cosmos mixes. I grew the Cosmos. You're going to let me hold them for you while okay. you talk. <laughs> I grew the Cosmos last year. They did really good. Then we got the uh, Snapdragon mix. Snapdra I like Snapdragons. They're pretty to me. And all these you can transplant, folks. So what you do, once you get done with your your maters, your peppers, your eggplants, get them in the ground, turn around, reuse them seed trays, start you some cut flowers. Just like your snapdragons, 40 days on them, you can have some pretty flowers. Quick, quick, quick. And then the last one here, we've got uh, this Xenia cactus mix. So this is a little different than our binary Xenias that we have. Petals look a little different. Uh, if you want to grow a lot of them, this is a little more affordable mix than the Benary is. We actually have these packed in quarter pound. What else? Half pound? Just quarter pound. Uh, quarter pounds. I, think, I know we got them in quarter pounds, and they're not 
they're not very expensive. I believe they're less than twenty dollars for right. a quarter of a pound. If you like to, if you don't want to transplant them and you like to just kind of go scatter sow, this would be. We have some people to around here that'll till up a little spot and they just like to grow some zinnias every year and they go out and broadcast them. Maybe recommend this is the variety that'll do for that. I'm not gonna say it's cheap. I'm gonna say it's more more affordable. Yeah, we don't want to call him by cheap. More we affordable. need to take that yeah. word out of our vocabulary. Let's talk about taters. Well, I got one more thing. <laughs> Talk so a lot of people's upset about your sticker design. Uh, they were you talking well, about I don't your, feel like I got a fair shake on the sticker thing. Well, man. people kept saying, well, I want to see Greg's sticker design. I want to see what was his design look like. And, and what y'all don't realize, that was the problem. There wasn't any design, and that's why there ain't no sticker. Well, now, hold on a minute. I thought I visually told you. Yeah, about, but I, I, I got to have some. I'm not a graphic designer. I... I no. I didn't relay what I wanted. You, to do. I got to have a sketch or something. We can't just work off these these pie in the sky ideas. We got I got to have something on paper. So I need to draw something off. You need to draw something up, and then well, we can I make didn't it know happen. That. I thought I had told you verbally. Yeah, we got to have something no. draw drawn up. Now, and then we had some other people say when you need to make some with the wheel hose on them. I got. Something working there. I'm gonna have a single wheel hose sticker, a double, and a high arch sticker. So I got at least three more coming on the pipeline there. And if if he can ever get me a sketch, maybe we can work on something there. All right, tater time, tater time, tater time. I'm glad I ain't got mine in the ground. Y'all gonna be replanting y'all's all this water. We shall see. We shall see. So we're gonna talk about potato fertilization. And some people got the taters in the ground. Some people way too wet. Uh, we're going to talk about how to fertilize potatoes, kind of what their needs are, excuse me, and give you a little program. Now, before we get into the major nutrient needs for potatoes, uh, so potatoes are a little different than some other crops, like corn. Now, corn's a heavy feeder, corn needs a lot of fertilizer, but with potatoes, there's kind of a fertilizer range there. And, and uh, if, you, if you do a lot of research on this, like the commercial growers, they know how much nitrogen they want to input for a uh, resulting harvest of X amount of pounds per acre. So if they want to get a real big, big taters, they can push, push more nutrients to them. If they want smaller taters, they can back off a little bit. That's a little different than something like corn, where you just don't give corn the fertilizer, you just really ain't going to have nothing. Right. So this, these nutrient needs we're gonna talk about potatoes are on the higher end of the scale. So you could back off these a little bit and still be fine. You're still gonna make potatoes. We just wanted to kind of talk about the cap and then you can, you can uh, scale it how you want to. How's that sound? That sounds good. Does that make sense? That makes a lot of sense to me. Okay, so let's talk about, we'll talk about some micros here in a little bit. Let's talk about the major big three, the N, P, and the K. And I took all the uh, per acre numbers I found, and I just like to boil everything down to pounds per thousand square feet. And these are pounds of nitrogen, so this is not pounds of fertilizer, it's pounds of nitrogen. We'll get in that number in just a second. So this is the total, total needs for the big three for your crop of potatoes per thousand square feet. And this is on the higher end. You can still make a good potato crop without using quite this much. This is just on the higher end. So we got five pounds of nitrogen per thousand square feet. We don't need as much phosphorus with potatoes, just a pound and a half per thousand square feet. We know we need plenty of potassium with potatoes. You know, the potassium surprised me just a little bit. Really? It did. And I don't know why, because it's a root crop. We all know all root crops take a lot of potassium. So five pounds per thousand square feet on the potassium there. Um, and so if you you did the, now and one more thing here, if you're a commercial potato grower, you can afford to buy a, a, a specific fertilizer for nitrogen, a specific one for each of these major ones and really fine tune your application. But for the home gardener or, or the person who's got a little small market farm, it may not be affordable or that's not really feasible. So, feasible, yeah. so what we recommend is just using a complete fertilizer, a 20, 20, 20, or a 10, 10, 10. And so I took the numbers right here and yeah, you are going to be a little high on the, you'll have a little more phosphorus than you need, but if you're doing a thousand square foot of potatoes, that's assuming 
you know, three foot row spacing, you would need about 25 pounds of 2020 to fertilize them throughout their entire lifespan. Now you could buy, sometimes I see the 15 or 15 or something like that, or yeah, 15 or 15 is probably the most common one without the phosphorus in there. Yeah. So they, at some of the hardware stores, you do see that occasionally, and that would make a decent fertilizer for potatoes. A 15, 0, 15, yeah. if you can find that, yeah. if you can find that. But a 20, 20, 20, a 10, 10, 10, anything like that would be good. This just kind of gives you an idea of how much you're needing to put out there. Um, so, Let's talk about... There, you're going to expand on the units, so we're going to wait on that. What do you mean, the units? Was it five pounds per... Well, that's why I wrote that down Oh, there. I didn't see that down Okay, there. so in a 10-pound bag of 20-20-20, you only have two actual pounds of nitrogen. That's why you would need... Uh, yeah, we're not talking about total pounds of fertilizer here. We're talking about units on the five pounds per thousand. Yeah. All right. I All just right. want to make that clear to everybody where they wouldn't get confused. So let, let's talk about our fertilization schedule, when we want to actually fertilize it. And I didn't, this was a new one on me as I was kind of uh, putting some of this together. If you don't have enough nitrogen early, it can cause early blight in your potatoes. Yep, tomatoes are the same way. Uh, so with potatoes, we've got that, say 25 pounds of 2020 20, 20 that we're gonna need over that thousand square feet. We, as with any crop, we don't want to give it all at one time. Right. We want to break that up. And so we've got our fertilization schedule here, our fertilizing schedule. So we want to put a third of that down at planting. So that's when you plant your potatoes. A lot of people will sprinkle it in the furrow there, or uh, or you can, a lot of times I'll just with my chicken manure compost, put it between the rows of the uh, plants, but it's good to put a little down there at planting. And then you're going to put some at or around emergence. Now this is, uh, there's a little bit of a window here. I would also say this could roll into the first healing as well. We need to talk about that a little later too. So he, with this fertilizing, it's always good if you're using granular or your side dressing, it's always good to bury it. And so it's, it's good to do your fertilizer when you're doing your healing, kind of kill two birds with one stone. So mm -hmm. with this one, you're gonna make a furrow and you're gonna put it in there and then you're gonna cover it when you cover your taters. At this fer second fertilization, do that on the first healing, makes it real easy for you. And then on your final healing, assuming you're gonna heal your taters at least two times, uh, you're gonna put the last third of that down there. So real simple here. Yeah. It doesn't get much simpler than that. But potatoes, they're not as heavy feeders as corn. They're probably somewhere in the middle of the road uh, as far as how much nutrients they need. If you want a good crop, you gotta give them some, uh, gotta yeah. give them some juice. Not only that, you gotta give them some minor nutrients too. Yes, yes, that's right. So in addition to giving them the big three there, the nitrogen, the phosphorus, and the potassium, which we got that, pull that out right there. So that's a, uh, we got some slightly different bags on those, don't we? Oh, it's got a little air in them. Oh, it's got a little air in them. So uh, that's our 20, 20, 20. Now say you was a, uh, um, go ahead and set that up there. Say your soil was high in potassium. Say you and had high plenty of phosphorus and you had plenty of potassium. Now, and one more thing that, that uh, potatoes need is plenty of calcium. They're a nightshade. Nightshades love their calcium. And, um, and calcium in potatoes is going to make sure they store well, mm -hmm. okay? It's going to prevent brown spot or help prevent brown spot. And yeah. if anybody's ever got that dreaded hollow heart in potatoes. Mm -hmm. Bless your heart. Uh, I think it, it probably happened to all of us at one point in time. Yep. That's a calcium deficiency if you, you end up with some holler taters. So if you did have a soil that was good in the P and the K, okay. But you want the nitrogen, you need that calcium. This calcium nitrate is the way to go. Now, yep. this is a, a really good fertilizer for any of your nightshades, your potatoes, your tomatoes, your peppers, your eggplants, all those that need that nitrogen but also need the calcium. And, and in this formulation, the calcium is a lot more readily available for uptake 
um, than in other formulations. Not only that, but this particular grade, you can inject the injector. There's different grades of calcium nitrate. We made sure we got one that would dissolve and go through the injector. So if you want to inject it, you can. And then we got some other micros. Sometimes like calcium, I don't know if I really consider a micro. Uh, it's kind of in the middle there between the big three and the micros. But the other micronutrients that potatoes need include magnesium, 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 <laughs> magnesium uh, sulfur, boron, and zinc. And we can get all that right here. Right here Boom. with this micro juice here. So take you, um, you know. It, put it in you can put it in your sprayer your watering can just drizzle down alongside that row there you ain't gonna mess up with this here and put that micro boost in there when you do your other fertilizer you can mix it in there or just kind of pour it alongside yep. there and that is going to do wonders for them so let's talk about healing just for a second some people on the show uh well, excuse me on our group row by row group got had a discussion about healing potatoes and indeterminate and determinate potatoes yeah. What's your take on that? So, so this is not as cut and clear. People you hear determinate and indeterminate, especially with tomatoes. It's a cut and clear. A determinate tomato is going to make a lot of tomatoes in a small amount of time. That's going to die. An indeterminate is going to keep producing boom, boom, until boom. the frost in, in most areas. But with the potatoes, it's not as cut and dry. So. What they really mean by an indeterminate potato is a potato with a later maturity date than most varieties. Your red potatoes, whether you plant red Pontiac, red Lesotho, or red New Orleans, those are all early varieties or what some people would call determinate tomatoes, or excuse me, potatoes. Um, some people say you don't need to heal those at all. I like to heal them just because it, it helps with the fertilization and it also helps with some weed suppression. Well, somebody said on that, and I, they posted a YouTube video, and I went by letting this guy, and I'm not throwing any harm toward him. He seemed like a really nice guy, and he was talking, and he had made some adjustments where he knew he'd made some mistakes, and he was making some updates. He said you did, uh, determinate potatoes did not require healing. The problem with that is the word require. Will you make a tater or two without healing? Yes. For it to be successful in growing a bumper crop, you need to heal those potatoes, whether they're determinate or indeterminate. It doesn't matter. Both of them need healing. And the reason they need healing is, is it stabilizes the plant more so than if you didn't. Also, it covers up those potatoes so the sunlight don't hit them, and they're nice and fresh and underneath that dirt. Potatoes just do better when they're healed. Now, you can heal them too much, but I always like to heal my potatoes, regardless what you got, what kind you're growing, you're going to be more productive and better satisfied to heal them. They're start softer. They just make better in that heal than they do in the growing them on the flat. The commercial guys heal them. Everybody heals potatoes. Right. And they do that for a reason, regardless whether it's determinate or indeterminate. So back to the indeterminate, and this is where there's kind of a gray line. So it's hard to tell where you draw the line is what's an indeterminate and what's not. Some people say a potato with a mid maturity date. Some people say a mid to late. Some people say just a late. Now we've got uh, two varieties that are considered late season that would definitely be indeterminate tomatoes. Those are the po potatoes. Potatoes. I'm, I shouldn't have started talking about bless tomatoes. You, bless your heart. I done got all messed up. Two late season or what would definitely be indeterminate potatoes are the German Butterball and the All Blue. Both of those are later. So now. Now where we live, I don't find that it matters a whole lot. They usually, they'll die off just a few weeks later than the red New Orleans. Now if you live somewhere where it don't just boom, get hot all of a sudden, you might could do this repeated healing like they talk about and, and it might grow somewhat indeterminately. Well, there's a lot of people out there growing pots and there used to be a YouTube video out there of people growing these tires and they add a tire and they add a tire and they add mulch and add mulch. If you're doing that potato tower thing where you want to just add to it, keep it getting bigger and bigger and your taters made down the bottom, you definitely want to grow the German Butterball, one of them light type varieties there. Those will do better in those potted situations where you're going to add stuff to them and grow up. If you can keep the plants cool. If you can keep them up. But there's some people that do that. Right. And if you're going to do that, there's more people plant, plant potatoes in pots than I thought there were. Right. And if you're going to do that, that makes a difference and that's where you go. Other than that, planting in that area in the garden like we do and working it and healing, 
It doesn't matter a whole lot if it's indeterminate or determined. You They're just going to come off a little You're going to treat it the same way. Yeah. Now, I do I, I do like planting some early, some mid, and some late taters because sure. you ain't got to dig them all at one time. Yeah, but you ain't going to treat them the same way as far as healing. I'm going to treat them the same way. The, the other two we have that are that are mid to late maturity that's probably still fall in that indeterminate range are the two fingerlings, the French fingerling and the Austrian crescent. So hope we clear that up. With potatoes, it's not a cut and dry line and depending on how you grow them uh it's not gonna make a difference yep we got some questions yes we do from last week's show and if we answer your question on the show <clears throat> send us an email oh you want a nice hat there ain't it? Hey, this is a nice hat we uh i ain't got these on the site yet because it's been too rainy to take a picture of them but we do got two new hat colors Yo, I don't know what I'm going to call this one. What do you think? Uh, I see. <coughs> it's like an olive green to me, but that don't really sound like a... Mm -hmm. I don't really like that name, but it, I like the hat. Yeah. And then this is uh, the red and silver. This is my favorite. Yeah. You like that one. All right. So... Wait, I didn't tell them. If, if, we, if we answer your question, send us an email to cussserve at hosttools.com, and we'll send you a nice little prize. Okay. Question number one comes from Rex Childers. He wants to know, where do you get your vegetable bags? He talks about his vegetable bags all the time, and okay. old Rex wants to know. So these right here. Now, even if you don't run a CSA slash weekly produce bag operation, I would highly recommend buying some of these. One, they are a heck of a lot cheaper than a Ziploc bag. They're, they're cheap, and because they're a little thinner, they just hold vegetables. I did a lot of testing with this because uh, sometimes I'm picking two to three days before I'm delivering stuff and these things keep greens and everything a lot better than a Ziploc bag or any other bag I've seen. It's the same thing you get at the grocery store. Okay, pull them off, they on a roll. These are a little bit wider and bigger because sometimes I grow them old big old cabbages and um, I need a wide bag to get them in there. But you can get these on Amazon. I buy them in, I think there's 500 per roll. And I buy like four rolls at a time, which, uh, you know, lasts me a few months. But uh, yeah, these things are handy to have around. Like I said, a lot cheaper than Ziploc bags. And I think they keep vegetables better than Ziploc bags do. Number two is from Debbie Schaefer. And um, I guess she's got some, some clay soil. And she was wanting to know, did she mix some sand in her soil? Uh, to help out with the carrots, and if so, what kind of sand? You could. I think the better route to go would be add some good compost. When you add that good compost, you're getting some nutrient value there, and you're feeding the microbes, and you're making a healthier soil system. So instead of the sand, I would suggest a good compost. Good keep broken down. Good broken down. Keep that soil fed. And, you know, another thing you could use if you got really compacted and you want to change the tip of the soil is you can add some gypsum. Gypsum. Good compost, either one of those things will work fine, and it'll, it'll be a little, you'll get more bang for your buck than you would with just straight sand. Sand ain't doing a whole lot. No. No, no, no any nutrients there. Number three, Tango Cat. I like that. Tango Cat wants to know, <coughs> I've been trying to grow patty pan squash, but I've been unsuccessful due to vine bores and powdery mildew. Can you provide some tips and tricks? Sure. So my buddy Jason over at Cog Hill used to have this problem, and uh, I got talking to him about it. And uh, if you have problems with insect or disease pressure on your squash, the most often problem I see is you ain't planting them early enough. You don't be waiting around on on these squash, y'all. Like I got my. We're we gonna get a little cold spill yeah. after this rain, and my finger is on the squash and the pole bean trigger. I'm talking about. It's, it's the number one thing, spring crop, you need to plant is summer squash. Yeah. That's the number, the first thing. First one after of that, the first things. Yeah. After that, you can start working the other. But always get your summer squash in first, and you'll have them in no time. Get get them get them in before you get your corn in, uh, anything. Get them summer squash in. That, in, that in the, way. In the February, first is on eight. That way, if your disease pressure and your insect pressure does accelerate like it's guaranteed to do, you're going to at least have some harvest in there. Now, you can, we will start a, we'll start a spraying program in March pretty early. We'll rotate some neem oil, some pyrethrin, and some uh, BT or spinosad and spray weekly. That helps. That's going to extend your squash growing season uh, because if you don't spray nothing 
them adults are going to start growing and multiplying pretty quick. But they're going to be a lot, there's a lot less population of vine borers early in the spring. Right. The earlier it is, the least amount of pressure you Get them have. in early, early, early. Early, early, early. Last one here is from Jesse Scott. And uh, I, meant, I, I left that, I meant to leave it up here from last week. He wants to know, is that Rivulus drip tape we sell any better than the Toro Aquatrax tape? And if so, what are the differences? I'm a little bit familiar with the Toro and the, I'm going to be completely honest. I don't think there's much difference in the quality. I think both of them are good tapes. I think it's regional. I think there, it seems like over on the West Coast in California, more people use Toro Aquatrax. Over here, whether you, we got farmers growing thousands of acres of, of peppers and watermelons down to people like us, everybody uses Rivulus. It's probably just based it, on what's it, available. It, it, it is somewhat regional. However, I don't think in quality is not much different in quality. No, I don't think either so one. either. The Rivulus company makes a role for us that works on our drip layer attachment. Uh -huh. Makes a small roll for us, 1,640 feet, and it's just what we need for the home gardeners, so that's the reason we deal with them. And that's why you can't find that Rivulus roll anywhere else. The Aquatrax rolls look more like our 15 mil yes. rolls. They're squatty and that won't work on the drip tape, drip tape layer. So those Rivulus rolls, that's the reason we use it. They make that roll for us. It fits that design. It just, everything works out good. And and it's, it's their, I won't say their headquarters are local, but they have a facility local and it's easy for us. Uh, to get more tape if we sure. need it. All right. Made in the USA, may I add? Made in the USA. Of course, I think the Toro is too, to be honest with you. Both of them made in the USA. Yeah, yeah. Believe it or not, I think the Toro is actually made in Florida. Huh, huh. It's, it just seems to be more popular I know, on the I, West I'm, Coast. I know, I agree with you. I don't know what it is. Uh, let's talk about next week's show real quick. So next, I've had several people ask to say, I want y'all to do another one in boom, 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 Q&A, rapid fire boom, shows. Boom. And uh, so we need some material for those shows. We've got to have viewer questions if we're going to do a completely viewer question show. So this is your opportunity this week. Load up those comments with viewer questions. Anything's fair game. It ain't even got to be gardening related. You can be talking about mm. um, buttermilk or cornbread or uh, whatever you want to, but anyway, put those any questions you might have you or that you want us to answer or anything you want us to talk about, put those in the comments and we'll do a neat little Q and A show next week. Uh, we hope you enjoyed this show and, and as always, any questions or, or anything like that are welcome. And if you enjoyed tonight's show, I think you'll enjoy these two videos right here. One's on uh, how to do the Florida weed trellis. Another one is on how small or how big you should transplant your tomatoes into the ground.